today we are going to talk about all of the scoping and planning and dreaming and designing that happens before you even touch WordPress. So I'm curious, who here is a developer? Okay, I'm proud of you for coming to a talk that has nothing to do with development. So <laughs> hopefully you'll learn a thing or two today. Um, I am Allie Green. I apologize for the display quality. I don't know why we're a little bit grainy up there. So bear with me. And if you can't read something, I'm happy to repeat. Um, I am the creative director, operations manager, and partner at Green Melon. We are a web studio just north of here in Marietta. Green Melon provides custom website, branding, design, and messaging solutions for small to mid-sized businesses. If you do have questions along the way, try to hold them for the end because, you know, there's a Q&A time at the end. So. so, let's all dive into a scenario. You have just landed a new job for a client who appreciates the process of building a website the right way. This means that we're empowered to approach the project from a strategic perspective. One where you consider content structure, user interface, and design before you touch development. Before we get started, we're sitting down with a client and we're having a discovery session. There's lots of questions that need to be asked. And if you're curious what some of those questions are, we have a page on our website, greenmelonmedia.com slash questions, that you can see our long list of kind of pre-qualification discovery questions to get the conversation started. But some key questions that we like to ask going into a project to help us with the actual deliverables, deliverables being content strategy, site map and design, are up here. A few of them, it's just simply asking the customer, your, your client, who is your ideal customer? What's the overall goal of the website? What's the main action you want users to make when they come to your website? What's the company's biggest pain point in the customer cons conversion process? What makes your company prevail over the competition? And what questions do you get asked by customers time and time again? This is all things that need to be in your resulting copywriting. The site map, just a good basic question, what pages do you want to have on your website? And you can use that as a foundation to build and suggest and add. In design, what are some other websites that inspire you and what are other companies in your industry? So these are baseline questions that should be asked along with some of the other discovery questions you can see there. And once you know those, you can really kick off your process. The process that we're going to look at today is the five steps that come before development. That's content strategy, site map, copywriting, UI design, and visual design. So let's start with content strategy. There are a few ways you can attack content strategy. One is to dig into the buyer journey, really a deep dive into the questions and thoughts and challenges a buyer has <coughs> while making a decision. The other is maybe just to ask the client some high level questions. What is your unique selling point? What is your value proposition compared to your competition? These are things that your customer or your client should already know. They may not know the buyer journey process. So let's dive into the buyer journey process. Understanding the buyer journey helps you to understand the buyer's challenges and questions, allowing you, the one creating the website, to craft content that eases the buyer's hesitations as they make a purchase decision. So ideally, this process includes interviewing clients. It includes sending out a survey to existing clients to understand better what are the questions and challenges you had when making this decision. Any insight you can get into the customer's mind is gonna help with the journey statements you're going to craft. So now, the buyer journey process can be as involved as you want it to be. Today, we're gonna simplify it down to just four steps for the sake of time. There's certainly 20-step buyer journey processes that you can go through. The four steps we're gonna look at are develop interest, gather information, compare options, and make a purchase decision. So step one, develop interest. This is when the buyer becomes aware they have a problem or a desire that they need to seek a solution to. So here's the scenario. Let's say your client offers home cleaning services and one of their prospects, Cindy, just looked around her house and realized her house is a disaster. So Cindy's gonna begin gathering information. She might ask her friends for advice. Do you have a house cleaner? Who can I use? I need to get this done quick. My parents are gonna be here tonight. 
Um, you're going you're to compare, maybe she's looking at some of your competitors' websites already. Um, maybe she's looking at local ads. Whatever she's doing, she's consuming, she's gathering, she's learning as much as she can to help solve this problem quickly. So how can we script some content to capture Cindy's attention quickly? Maybe dust inside your home can increase your risk of allergies or even give your guests a bad first impression. So with Cindy's family coming to visit, I would say that this content would probably strike a chord with her. Next, she's going to compare options. She has the competition sitting here in one tab, your, your client's website in another tab, a client's a friend's referral sitting here, a phone number on her desk. So she's evaluating and comparing. Who do I want to hire? Who can, who's available first? Who's quickest? Who's cheapest? You know? So um, letting your client, let, so letting her know that your client offers both recurring and one-time cleaning services um, to help her get ready for her family's visit is probably a good way to, um, to give her, to perk her interest, to look further. The next step is make a purchase decision. So Cindy's compared options, it's a simple process. She's comparing what's there and including a value-based call to action can help convince her to make a purchase. Luckily, your client provides online estimates with an online scheduler. So your call to action can be, let our team of professionals give you the clean home you want and the free time you need worry-free. Schedule now with our online calendar. This convenience factor, convince Cindy to go with your client's company. So now that we know the process that a typical customer is going to go through, we can begin working on the page content or the site map or the page structure, excuse me, or the site map. Has anybody worked with a client to create a site map before? Awesome. Good deal. So a site map, as I said, is the page hierarchy of a website. It helps determine the pages that will ultimately need to be designed and built. So when we define the site map, we're considering the path the buyer takes to make a decision. Luckily, we just uncovered the buyer journey process in the, free, in the previous step. So this should be a fairly simple process. This paired with any special features that might have been in the scope, maybe e-commerce, maybe some, some custom functionality, these should create a pretty fluid sitemap. Sitemaps can be anywhere from five to eight pages to 100 to 200 pages, so beyond and beyond. I mean, so there's, this can certainly be as involved or as, um, as minimal as needed. This would be a good question to ask during that scoping process. How many pages do you want? Like I said, how many pages do you expect to have on the site? What are these ideal pages? It'll help you budget for the site a little bit better. So there's some base pages that you, consider, you should consider for every site map that you build. Again, it's terribly grainy. Um, the home page, obviously, is where you should state a problem solution statement. Clearly state what the, what the user's problem is and how your company can solve it. The about page should have your value proposition. The what we do page should showcase your product or service, naturally. There'll probably be quite a few subpages below there. Your blog or your FAQs page should answer more questions that the buyer has during their buyer journey. So ultimately, you know that there's quite a few questions that Cindy or your buyer is going to ask while they make this decision. Including those as blog posts is awesome. You can even title the blog post the question that your buyer is asking. And that way, when they're Googling, hopefully that question will start to surface. Um, with your answer. The contact or call to action page naturally is your conversion point. <coughs> and then also consider feature-based pages. If it's an e-commerce site, where does the cart live? Where does the login page live? And is there a wholesale page? And where do all of these flow in the page hierarchy? And finally, consider SEO pages. If you've done keyword research, you probably need to make sure there's pages on the site where you can incorporate each keyword onto a resulting page. If you went to Jenny's session, you can kind of understand that concept a bit more. <coughs> also, if you're doing an AdWords campaign, naturally you're going to need landing pages for that AdWords campaign to land on. So consider those. Where are those going to live in the sitemap? Some helpful tools <coughs> for building your sitemap is our chosen tool. First is Slick Plan. Um, Slick Plan is a pretty intuitive way to make a flow chart add some notes, add some notations about what each page is going to be. Um, the cool thing about Slick Plan is you can export um, the Slick Plan as a WordPress X XML file and then import it and you'll automatically create a menu so you don't have to kind of copy paste and recreate the sitemap, especially the ones that are, you know, 100 plus pages that can get a little tedious. 
three uh, two others that I've not used is Gliffy and OmniGarful. Uh, or Graffle, excuse me, and I actually used to think that was Omni Giraffe, so I'm glad I finally yeah. read it a little bit closer. <laughs> but, um, and heck, if you don't want to use a tool, you can just whiteboard this, you know, think through the process on a whiteboard and take a picture when you're done or do it on a cocktail napkin. As long as you're going through this process, you're doing the right thing. Now, we now know every page that needs to be on the website so we can begin copywriting. Um, the, copyright, the copywriting process should always start with a content outline. Think back to high school. You would always do an outline, a content outline for your research papers, right? What's the, what's the introduction? What's the body content? What's the conclusion? It's what we learned in grade school. It does not change when, you, when it comes to actually to building a, a much larger research paper. So just like that, every page should have the same basic elements. Um, so as you're writing your content outline, consider each of these for every page. A main message, a clear, concise overview of the page. This is a great place for a problem solution statement, once again. Um, and then every page is going to have a series of supporting messages. These should be quick thoughts. You know, we want to avoid doing paragraph format in any sense. We want to make sure that we have headline, subhead, short paragraphs, short bullet points, something that's easy to skim. Key, include key visuals that might need to be on the page. Your client might have some awesome photography or video content. You might be creating an infographic for this particular page. And the content outline is a great way to notate that. That way, when it does get to development, nothing's lost in translation. You want every page to be pretty defined. And then finally, every page should have a clear call to action. Um, and this should be defined by referencing back to your buyer journey. We know what the next step is going to be as the client or as the customer makes a decision. So some helpful tools that we use for copywriting. Uh, Google Docs is a freebie and really as good as any. Um, it's great for version control. You're not going to have five different Word documents floating around and not know which one is, has been edited most recently. Um, it's also, let's see, gather content is also a great one for version control. It's just a little bit pricey, but it maintains that sitemap structure. And then you can literally click on each page, insert your content and submit it. And there's great um, collaboration tools as well in gather content. Google Docs, on the other hand, it's very simple. You can actually change the doc into suggestion mode and your client can just add their suggestions to the doc rather than editing the actual content, just like in a Word doc, but it's kind of a hidden feature that not everybody knows about. And then finally, a homegrown solution that Green Melon has created is called Content Collector. Content Collector is essentially a multi-site that we've created. We create one per client. If the client is writing content, we'll create one for them. The client can then log in, and we've already exported that slick plan site map that we created at the previous step and imported it into Content Collector and created the navigation menu. So now every client can go in and add their content to each page. You know, they may be working on it on the side in a Word document and that's fine, but we ask them at the end, go in, log in, we do a quick little video for them, a screencast. Here's how you insert your copy to the page and publish it. It's hidden from, you know, it's not indexed, Google can't see it. And once, we, once they're complete, we close down Content Collector, export all of that content and import it into the staging site. And there it is for working. You know, you, no copying and pasting and um, it kind of takes out that admin work as well. So the next step is user interface design or wireframing. Who knows what wireframes are? Would anybody like to share? <laughs> I saw somebody's hand go up right there. Uh -uh. The wireframes are a blueprint of the website before colors, graphic elements, shapes, textures, photography, anything is introduced. This really helps you to figure out the flow, the structure, the content layout, the story of a page. Every page should have a story from start to finish, introduction, <coughs> a middle, and an end. So figuring out the wireframe is going to help you tell that story. It's important to do this not only for desktop, but also for mobile interfaces, um, plainly because you want to make sure that you define the goals for desktop and for mobile. They could be different. 
On desktop, you might want users to fill out a contact form because they're sitting at a computer with um, a, you know, a quick way to type. On a mobile device, you may want them to click to call. You know, the goal and the conversion point may change between, home, between desktop and mobile. So considering that during your wireframing process is an important step. <coughs> um, ideally, at this point, you have real copy to work with in this phase, but nine times out of 10, all you have is your content outline, but that's okay. Because you can create, you can take this content outline, you know the main message and the support, supporting messages, the call to action, and any necessary visuals that need, that need to be on the page at this point, because we've done a content outline for every page. So using shapes and icons and, and boxes and circles, you can lay this out into a basic layout. And figuring out these different pieces at this point is gonna help the copywriter with word count. You know, how much space, so a lot of people ask, which should come first, the content, or the wireframe, right? Um, and if, you're, if you have a team like Green Melons, you have a copywriter on staff and you can work directly with her as you build out the wireframes and kind of create this copy and flesh out this copy while you work, but sometimes that's not the case. So that content outline stage is so important for creating your wireframe because now you can actually have an idea of how the page should flow. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, keep in mind, you don't need to design anything in the wireframe phase. Black and white, plain as can be, the simpler the better. The less designed, the better, or the client's gonna fixate on certain things like fonts. So um, keep that in mind, design will come next. And be sure also to add notations to the developer so they know the functionality of each content block. If you kinda have an idea that you want some area to be a tabbed, you know, a tab section, make sure you kind of add some notations in this point um, throughout the page layout so that the developer knows what your vision is going into it. And if you have questions about how to do that, we have some tools to help. Our chosen tool is UX Pen. Has anybody heard of UX Pen? Yep. Cool. Yeah, we've been using that one. I used to use Illustrator and UX Pen has, has been a step up for me. Um, it not only allows for developer notations, but it also allows for your clients to comment and add their thoughts in preview mode or in presentation mode. Um, it, so it's a great way for collaboration and feedback. It also has a great saved library of modules so you can reuse elements on various pages rather than copying and pasting them or, um, or redesigning them. And um, Illustrator has similar tools. You can certainly save your, your elements, but I like the sharing tools that UX Pen has. Um, you can also, in UX Pen, of course, create your desktop view, your mobile view, your tablet view, whatever, whatever you need. So, depends on how big the project is. Sometimes you just create a desktop view and you do the mobile, the mobile pieces in browser. And if that's the kind of job you're working on, that's totally fine. Um, let's see, Axure. Has anybody ever used Axure? Yeah, awesome. Um, so this one is, in my experience, for bigger projects, you know, more maybe um, product development things like that, but very powerful tool. Um, has the same, same uh, features as UXPIN with collaboration and everything like that. So if you're looking for a high level wireframing tool, that's a great one. And three that I've not used are Pencil Project, um, Wireframe, and Mockups. Does anybody have other tools that they've used? Cool, I covered them. So now we can finally move on to design. Notice how late in the process design is. This is on purpose. We've now done all of the strategy necessary to really make sure we've done, we've, we've done our research, we've done our homework, and now we can present, we can add the visuals, we can add the graphics. The content is strong, the content is there. This is the part that the client really gets excited about. They finally get to see their site come to life. And this is when the wireframe morphs into a branded piece for your client. There we go. Uh, while your design should flow from the content structure that we've defined in the wireframes, there are a few best practices that you can use um, to help make sure that you're really following what your customers, what your client's idea of a best practice is, or a good experience is, I should say. So the client's going to have likes and dislikes. We all know that you might design an interface that you think is absolutely beautiful, and a few things may derail it. Um, we learned in, in Nathan's section that data could derail it. We could learn that the buttons shouldn't be blue, they should be red, and that's how you convert. 
So that's kind of a, a follow-up step when we do a, if you do A-B testing or user testing. Um, but the client might have opinions. They may not like blue. They may not like orange. So you want to kind of know that going into it so you're not spinning your wheels on something that's not going to be successful. So a few things you can do. First of all, a competitive review. Review any competitor's websites that your client has given you or that you've found in the process just to make sure that you're creating a unique environment, a unique design that's going to be different from the, you know, the closest competitor. Look at some inspiration websites. Don't discredit uh, Pinterest and Behance. And find some modules and, and just different elements that are similar to the brand that you're, that you're trying to build and put, put them in an inspiration folder. Every little bit helps. You know, all of the different interactions and different techniques that you can do um, in development now, you want to make sure that you're taking those into account. Another fun idea is what we call a gut check. Gather five to ten different websites that you think are strong and show them to your client. Get them on the phone, do a little screencast, or let them click through and have them write down what they like and dislike about those websites. It'll give, give you an idea of do they like simple websites? Do they like super creative websites? Do they like a lot of interaction? You know, So that's going to help guide you in the right direction. And then finally, you can do a mood board. A mood board would be maybe a slide deck of, of stock photos, colors, shapes, textures, visuals that you're envisioning for the website. And if you get them to sign off on that before you dive into design, it's going to be easier to get that approval. So with your inspiration in hand, it's time to build the design for the website. Once the design is approved, the next step is development. And this is when I think the magic happens. I hand over the design comps, the wireframes, the developer notes, and it turns, it's, it's like Christmas Day when all of a sudden the website is built with a beautiful responsive interface, and, um, and that's where the developers get to chime in. But it's not done yet. Once your website is built internally, the group needs to come back together for what we call the quality assurance phase. There are a lot of steps that need to happen before a website's ready to launch. With all of these steps comes the possibility for confusion and miscommunication. As the site moves through the process from writer to designer to developer, a lot can get lost in translation. So it's important that everyone comes together at the end of the build for a quality assurance phase. During this phase, you can review as an internal team um, and just kind of offer your feedback and comments to make sure that the site is as you planned it to be. Or you can go a little more in depth. You can do focus groups. You, know, you can bring in some of those clients that you interviewed during the, during the buyer journey process and have them take a look at your new, the new website and offer their feedback on it and make changes at this point. You can also employ, engage with a website like usertesting.com. Has anybody done a user test before on user testing? They're fun. Yep, Mark, you have. Awesome. Yeah, we've done a few, and you get a lot of feedback to process through. Um, because they actually dictate what they say as they're clicking through. So you're sitting there listening to them and taking notes on all of these little nuances that they're finding and making adjustments. But definitely creates for a good experience because your users are actually navigating through the site and providing feedback. <coughs> so I think I did that fairly quickly, but um, open for questions. We have a good 30 minutes left. So if anybody has questions that you want to ask or things you want to share, Well, you define the process, you define the test, so to speak, and say the steps you want them to go through, and then it, it brings in random customers. Yeah, and they interview and go through the process with their microphone, and then you just listen in and say, okay, well, they obviously can't find the buy now button, so let's change that. So, yeah, it is cool. How do you handle the client or clients who, at the visual design stage, you show them those gut check sites and they say, oh, <coughs> I really like this. Uh -huh. And then somebody else on their team says, I really like that. And neither one of them is anything like your initial. Sure. Good question. framing or any of that. Good question. I would probably say discuss amongst yourselves and come up with a consensus. Or when it comes down to it, it's not their opinions. It's the user's opinions. Yeah. So that's the tricky part, is your client's going to have opinions. Everybody does. 
So how do we get the client to do weigh in on it? you do user testing before you actually have a site complete? Like in the wireframing phase yes. or something? We have not, but certainly doable. Especially if you're going to do a wireframe, you can use something like Envision to do a full interactive wireframe. Now, you can't build wireframes in Envision. You can only present them and create those, in, those interactions. So um, if you wanted to go to the, to the point um, of creating an interactive wireframe experience, Envision is one way you can do that. Does Axure do that as well with an interactive experience? Not sure. It does more than Envision? OK. But you can make it interactive. And, and UX Pen, you can make it interactive too. Um, so if you want to go through that process and do some user testing of that, yeah. certainly possible. Envision EN or I IN? Yep. Sketch also. Sketch. Sketch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just like Illustrator and design, you could build a wireframe in Sketch. Can you do interactions there? Yep. Okay. Cool. What else you got for me? Yeah. Um, I work for a nonprofit, so my end customer is the clients we serve okay. as well as the donors and volunteers. Sure. How do you balance two different audiences? You have two different audiences? You can go through two buyer journey processes. Oh, yep, absolutely. She said she works for a nonprofit and she has two audiences, which is very common. I mean, you want to narrow it down as much as possible, but she has two audiences, the donors and the actual clients you serve. Mm -hmm. So how do you craft the buyer journey process or this process? towards two audiences. You do it twice, really. You know, you talk about one. And that's why I simplified this buyer journey process down. It's just four steps. So it's not digging deep into every little psychological thought that they have, which is what a few of them do, but uh, or a few of the processes can do. But yeah, run through it. Run through each one. And it can be as simple as kind of talking with the, your client or your internal team and just say, Let's think about this. How are our clients finding us? And what are their challenges? And how can we solve them? But yeah, you almost want to create a persona for each one. You know, you have Julie and you have Bob. And let's talk about how they, how they go through the process together. Yeah. Yes? Do you guys ever get input and <coughs> feedback from your clients on the content process? Um, and are there ever, uh, like, uh, I guess, scenarios where they're writing a lot of it or in every yeah I, in my experience I've, we've had a lot of slow clients to, to mm -hmm. do that content's always the bottleneck right so how, how do you handle that yep so his question was how do you handle when clients are submitting content and it's undoubtedly going to be a bottleneck um, we do what we call what do we call it now we just changed the name of it page descriptions I think um, so content outlines are what we do when we're building the content because we're creating the wireframes with that content outline. We have our copywriter do a page description for every page. So it's just we make sure it's part of our scope. And once we do that site map, we send the client content collector. And in content collector, we have a page description for every page. This is what you're right. This is what you're supposed to write about here. This is what you're supposed to write about here. So hopefully that's going to get their wheels spinning a little bit and be like, oh, it's kind of more like filling in the blanks and kind of. I mean, they've got a lot of blanks to fill in. But um, if they are writing content, I like to reserve the wireframing phase for once they submit that content. Um, because then we always have a copy editing phase. If the client's handling content, we always do copy editing. So copy editing allows us to take their paragraphs of content that they're probably going to submit to us and slice and dice it into digestible pieces. And then we can wireframe. Because those like, even if we do a content outline for them with with um, main message and supporting <coughs> messages, those supporting messages can be, in, I mean, you give them as many required, you try to restrict them. Right. So copy editing is the way that we make sure that it's clean and ready to go to the web. Um, the hold up is just a whole lot of bugging <laughs> and babysitting <laughs> and <laughs> nagging. Um, and taking, but the, the good thing is, is with Content Collector, you can kind of peek in and say, what have they done? How, f you know, how far along are they? Um, and see the progress that they're making. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, so how do you build for something like this? Uh, because there could be a lot of back and forth, or there could be very little back and forth. Mm -hmm. I can see those two scenarios. Mm -hmm. So do you, how do you build for something like this? Technically, the way we build for it, bill for it, um, he asked how you bill for something that's a bit more strategic like this. How do you factor in the time that you can't anticipate the back and forth? 
first of all, we allot for one major and two minor revisions at every deliverable. So at least at that point, we know it's, it, if it goes over this, we have to start going hourly. Um, but we have this master spreadsheet that we have created over the years that's a few screens long of this service is this much, and, you know, and we've kind of clocked our time, over, time on it over the years to know the value of each one. And we fill in that spreadsheet, and that's kind of our cheat sheet for creating a quick proposal. Um, but at least everything's there. You know, it's, you're not going to miss something or forget about something. And you know messaging strategy usually takes 20 hours, so let's account for it, um, or 10 hours, whatever it is. So that helps, but limiting the revision process is what's going to keep it in scope. Yeah. Yes. What do you consider a revision, major and minor? Major and minor. So on the design front, a major revision would be, I mean, scrap it. <laughs> Start over, I hate it, right? Anything from that to can we rearrange, you know, the layout or the, the images I don't like. I mean, you kind of feel when it's a really heavy um, revision. And then lighter revisions, minor revisions are going to be, um, can we tweak the size of the font? You know, this feels a little big, this feels a little small, it's scale, you know. Um, in messaging, a major revision would be a whole lot of red lines, you know, in the Word document, and you realize they're probably not happy with this, and kind of, re, you know, reworking that content. Or, and that's worst case scenario, best case scenario is, you know, can you add this paragraph here, and then from there it should just be some wordsmithing. Yeah, does that answer it? Yes. So because you do all of that stuff before the build, yeah. um, I'm assuming then are all your builds custom? Mm -hmm. Do you work in, is it WordPress that you use? Mm -hmm. Is the back mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we build custom sites. If we're doing a template site, maybe for an existing client, um, we have them submit the stuff to us. So rather than us figuring it out for them. So if it's a, if it's a template build um, or a theme build, we'll say, send us your sitemap. And oh, by the way, Slick Plan's really cool if you want to go in there and make an account and send us your, you know, send it to us. Yeah. And then we'll submit, we'll send them the, con the content collector. They put it in. We go through some themes with them. We pick a theme. Um, they submit their content to us per that theme. We'll literally say header one, subheader one, body content one, button one, header two and let them fill in the blanks that way. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. How do you handle like, uh, pictures and, and visuals that are coming from a client? That are coming from a client. We either set up a Dropbox account. Dropbox has a really cool feature now. You can request an import. I don't know what they call it exactly. I don't know if anybody else knows. But you can set up a, f a folder and ask, and Dropbox will send an email to your client to have them upload to submit pictures to that folder so they show up there rather than doing the whole shared folder thing. But you can also just create a shared folder with them. Or I've taken jump drives, I've taken CDs, I've taken all sorts of things, but, but yeah. Mark. As, as far as content goes with in images and photos and so forth, do you all help the customer select and pick in because <coughs> clients sometimes get crazy with images? Yeah, that's when I like to do a mood board to start and I'll throw a bunch of stock photos in there if they, if they don't have photography or if we're not doing a photo session or something. Um, I will put, and sorry, his question was how do you, um, do you help the clients uh, pick images or do you let them send all of their own images? But that mood board I have found if we put in five stock images and say this is the feel and this is why we're choosing these images, you know, one of them, one of our clients, I mean, they are a hard-working IT firm. And when we, I made sure to put in images that showed a little bit of hustle in every image, you know, just, you know, they're just not posed and just, you can tell that they're rushing a little bit because that's their world. And so I got them to sign off on those style images before they went into the site or before we select them. Does that help? Someone else? Oh, sorry. I'll get you next. Hold on. Yes, in the back. When you were talking about content collector, yeah. do you use like a specific plugin to do that for your clients? <laughs> It's a WordPress multi-site that we've created. So we spin up a new site, like mm -hmm. super basic um, for every client, and you might have additional it's things to say. Yeah, it's just a watered down theme that has a very clear navigation bar at the top, because all we want them to do is to pick a page 
it, sign in, pick a page, press edit page, and add their content, and press publish time and time again for every page. So it's super simple. You do have to show them how to use the dashboard just a bit, where that publish button is. But um, you can do that in a screencast, and then they're pretty, I mean, it's, it's, it's WordPress. It's easy. Um, yes, Claudia. Just adding on to that. So would you do that if it's a small 10 to 20 page site even? Like yeah, those are the ones we do it for because Usually a small 10 to 20 page site is writing their own content because they're trying yes. to keep budgets down. Right, right. So that's when we use Content Collector most is when they're writing their own content. Right, rather than get a collect a Word document from them. Right, right, right. Rather than collect a Word document because, because you can then export from Content Collector and import to the staging site rather than take every Word document and paste it in, which you can do, but it kind of gives you a good baseline for starting the build. So my actual question was, okay. at the A-B testing, yes. do you do it for every site? No. Okay. What, where, why? We personally do A-B tests once they're, once they're a long-time client of ours. You know, maybe a year in, we'll say, okay, let's start doing some A-B tests for this button, this call to action. How can we make conversion a little bit better? It's not something we do a ton of. The user test, the user testing that we did, all happens to be for that same site, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, the user testing that we did was right at launch? Uh, and it was right before launch. Right, or yeah, right before launch. So that was the one, yeah, they were a larger project. So not everyone, but. Okay, good. Sorry. Yeah, no. But the A-B testing can be really easy. I mean, we use uh, Fresh Marketer, right? Fresh Marketer, and it provides you with a lot of different tools from heat maps to A-B testing. Um, and the A-B testing is really pretty slick. You put in, I want the button to say A or B, and it runs the test, tells you what the winner is, and you can literally just say, go with A, and it automatically reflects it on the, on the site. So um, it's real, I mean, tools have come so far. So Fresh Marketer, also called Zargit, um, is one to look at. Zargit or Fresh Marketer is a good one for A-B testing. Same thing, it's just one, I think they changed their name. Yes? I think you've already kind of touched on this before, but do you think that Slick Plan has been the best solution for you for charts and just site structure? I've stuck with it for years now. I keep trying to find another one. That's like been the hardest thing for us to kind of show that to the client, show the, the, you know, the blueprint, the, you know, what the foundation of the site is. Yeah, it's, I literally send them the preview mode of Slick Plan, and you can add comments in each page so you can kind of say this page, kind of like those page descriptions that I was mentioning, you know, for each, in each page in the, in the flow chart, you can have a little comment. And actually when you export Slick Plan and import it into WordPress, it keeps those comments in the body. So that way, as long as those were clean and ready to, to kind of be the guiding direction for each page, they'll show up in the page content. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I keep trying to find a better one because it's a little bit, I find myself wishing it was a little bit more intuitive, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it gets the job done. Awesome. Yeah. More, more. Is that it? Okay, well now you only have 20 minutes left to hang out, so <laughs> it's a little better. <laughs> cool, I'll hang around if you have questions. <laughs>